Good evening. My name is Jim Kello. Welcome to New Tracks, where mentors help modelers build. Thanks so much for coming this evening. Hope you come back often uh, and tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy it too. Uh, if you're new to the show, please visit our website, newtracksmodeling.com and subscribe. You'll get an email from the website, verify your email is correct. And if you'll confirm your email, uh, then in the future, you'll get all the logins and all of the information about our future shows. Uh, and if you do subscribe and get that information and have a friend you'd like to share it with, we have no problem with that at all. We just ask you not to post it on any group uh, because of security reasons. Uh, we do need some help with our show, as you can imagine. It's all volunteers. Uh, and we have several positions that we need help with. One of them is a uh, YouTube moderator uh, to keep track of the uh, chat functions on uh, YouTube so that we know if someone has a question and we can try to answer their question uh, appropriately. Uh, and so we need people that can help us do that. Uh, and we also need people uh, that can fill in and be the, uh, the person who is uh, the technical uh, person behind running all of these shows. Uh, they call them uh, host, I believe. Uh, but really what it amounts to is that they get to be able to start the show and make sure that uh, the technical aspects of the show are done correctly. So if you're interested and can help us in one of those uh, positions, uh, please send me an email at jimkello at newtracksmodeling.com. Uh, and we can talk about uh, what your interests are and uh, how we can uh, work together for the improvement of the show. Uh, let me announce some uh, build-alongs, which are getting to be really important, I think, to the show, because it's, uh, it's allowing modelers who may not have built for quite a while or may just want to see how uh, the current uh, craftsman kits are, uh, to in effect have somewhat of a crutch or a mentor that's building that same kit live in short segments uh, once a week. Uh, and uh, you can get the kit at a discount from the manufacturers because they're participating with us uh, and uh, enjoy the build along and, and learn how to uh, maybe improve your modeling and maybe learn some new techniques that you didn't know. So I think they're really important for the, uh, the function of the show. Uh, tonight, Rick and Marie Hunter are continuing their, uh, their, their build along of their Hunter line 81 foot trestle. Uh, they're building the straight trestle, but the uh, same kit can build a curved trestle. It's just a little bit more complicated from what I understand. I've, I'm not built one, so I'm, I'm counting on what Rick has told me. Uh, on September the 22nd, that's next Wednesday, uh, Martin Brett built MMR starts his uh, build along of a Leadville Designs maintenance of way car. Uh, if you're thinking about doing this with Martin, it's not too late to order the car. Uh, and all of the information on Hunterline and all of these build alongs is on our website with the details of the discounts you get, how to get the discounts, uh, what you have to uh, uh, say in order to qualify for the discounts. And basically it's uh, to mention that you're on new tracks. Some of the manufacturers require the new tracks to be one word, others uh, two words. So you'll need to check on the uh, individual company uh, on our website. Uh, then October the uh, 13th, Jim Murphy is going to start a, a LaBelle woodworking company kit of a business car. That's going to be an HO. Martin's kit is going to be an O scale model. Uh, Bill Davis then on October the 16th is going to start a rail scale model. And this rail scale model is of a tobacco barn, comes in all four scales, N, H, O, S, and O. Uh, then on November the 6th, David Schultz uh, is going to start building an all nation waffle side boxcar kit in O scale. Uh, this is important, I think, because all nation is a company that's being brought back after being out of the hobby. Uh, because of the death of the uh, previous owner for some time. And uh, it's being brought back to the market now. And uh, the new owner, uh, John uh, uh, Wuffle, uh, has been kind enough to participate in uh, the build along with one of his new products. And I think you're really going to enjoy 
what David is going to do with this car. Then the next my bill, which is your turn to share your modeling with everybody else, uh, comes up next Wednesday, September the 22nd. Chris Kors is back from vacation or trip or business or wherever he has vanished to for the last few months. Uh, but he's with us this evening and I will turn it over to Chris for his comments about his upcoming My Build. Well, first off, Jim, thanks. Um, it was absolutely no vacation. Uh, I think the temperature was about 120 every day. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, let's see, back to the My Builds. Uh, I will share the lovely uh, the uh, the slide we have for that, and of course it's uh, it's back to the old my builds that we we had before. Uh, in order to participate um, in the my build, uh, please drop me uh, your photos to uh, railrunner130 at hotmail.com, and uh, what I'll do is I'll put you in queue and uh, with those pictures. So when um, when your turn comes up, then I can flash the pictures and you can and uh, talk to uh, talk to your slides. So um, anyway, that I've always found that the my builds have been a particularly interesting part. Uh, if you haven't participated, please do so. Uh, share whatever you've got. Um, you know, I shared one that, quite frankly, I, I rushed through and did a horrible job on. But you know, there were some lessons there. So hopefully that uh, I pass that along to some other people so that they can learn from it and. Um, you know, maybe you've got a, maybe you're stuck on something and need, uh, need a little bit of help with uh, something. And uh, that's what my build's all about too, is maybe, uh, maybe you could use some help. So let us know, um, or maybe something you're proud of, or something weird that you found, something along those lines. Drop me an email with, uh, with some pictures, and uh, I'll put you in the queue. And uh, thanks, Jim. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And, and I really hope everybody will uh, participate with this uh, because this is just as an important uh, part of the show as any of the, uh, the build alongs or any of the other segments that we do uh, because it demonstrates uh, the, the modeling capability of the people on the show and uh, what they're involved in and what they're doing. And, and it's, a, uh, it's an incentive for other modelers to uh, maybe build something that they haven't tried before and see uh, exactly who they might be able to talk to if you're interested in, in certain uh, techniques that they see on the my bill. So I think it's a critical part of the show. And if you uh, have a model, I hope that you'll uh, send Chris a, a photo so that we can uh, show it on the uh, next show next Wednesday. Uh, if you have a question, any question about modeling, uh, we have a form on our website if you'll fill it out. We'll either have somebody try to answer it on, uh, live on the show, or as, in, as happened in the past, we've had uh, people do segments of, on the show to, uh, to demonstrate uh, the, uh, the answer to a person's question. So as far as I know, we've answered everybody uh, that has uh, given us a question. We've answered them all or had modelers on the show answer them. And uh, if you have one, please let us know. Uh, door prizes, we don't have one tonight. I'm always interested in door prizes because I think they're unusual and different and uh, add something to the show. Uh, and it's up to the, uh, the manufacturers if they want to participate. All they have to do is let me know and, and uh, let me know what door prize they might want to give. If they don't want to participate, then they don't participate and we won't have door prizes. Uh, Walters has come out and announced the winners of their this year's, and this is the first one that they've done, of a $2,500 real uh, scholarship to a college for their STEM, if they're involved with a STEM program in college. And these are the two gentlemen that just graduated from high school and are going to start college next year. And they are Walter's first two winners of this $2,500 scholarship. Uh, I am so promotion back, back of this and, and, and think Walter's is just doing a fantastic thing for the hobby. Uh, because I really truly believe that if more companies and particularly trade associations that serve the hobby, uh, the Manufacturers uh, Hobby Association, 
the uh, the hobby shop, National Retail Hobby Shop Association. Uh, any association that is involved in the hobby that wants to help young people progress in their knowledge of modeling uh, and, and possibly even pursue a career uh, through the uh, 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 Association of Professional Model, Make, Model Builders, uh, I think that that association ought to be offering scholarships too. Uh, so I I'm firmly believe that this is a way of getting more young people interested in our hobby. Um, if they know that there's, I guess, a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, they don't necessarily have to give up their modeling uh, uh, because they, they need a career. There are major careers out there uh, for, for model builders uh, and, and for companies uh, to support model railroaders in trying to further their education in the STEM areas. I think it's fantastic and, and should really be encouraged. Uh, and I, I truly hope that, that if you all get a chance, that you can encourage the companies that you do business with to participate as Walters have. Maybe not to the same level as Walters, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, but, but, but participate in some way, because I can't think of a better way of getting young people involved in our hobby than offering them scholarships and possible careers down the road. And now I'd like to turn to uh, uh, our quick tips for this evening and get off my soapbox here uh, and introduce uh, Paul Thompson, who is uh, home with uh, Clark Cooney this evening. Paul? Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, we're going to try something a little different tonight. And uh, here's tonight's quick tip. Quip, quick tip. <laughs> You got to stop drinking up there, Paul. I know. I'm Paul Thompson, and I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, Steve Wood, who's going to give us an end scale tip for this week. Thank Steve. you, Paul. Uh, today, we're going to show you how to take a uh, body shell off of a Cato freight engine. It's as simple as this. First, we take the engine out of its jewel case. So then we take the, the, the lid, we put it on the table. And then what we do is we take the front walkway, we place it on the edge of the jewel case. And then all we do is we give it a little drop, and then a little wiggle, and off it comes. Now that is slick, because I'd have been in there with toothpicks and Trying to just oh, spray it off. Uh, I would never have known that. Easy as pie. Easy as one, two, three. Thank you very much, Steve. That's a great tip. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. That is a great tip. That, that is really something. I, I've never seen anything like that before. Thanks so much, Steve and Paul. You're welcome. Well, now I'd like to turn to uh, our build along this evening with uh, Rick and Marie Hunter. Uh, for their 81 foot trestle from their company Hunter Line. Rick, Marie, welcome. Hi, Jim. How are you doing tonight? Hello. Doing great. We're uh, Rick Hunter. We're Rick Hunter and Maureen, my fantastic wife, and we own Hunter Line in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, we are doing a uh, trestle, one of our kits, and uh, we're building, everybody's building along with us, which is great. So, um, where we left off last week, uh, we want to just continue along that. We were doing our tie stringer assembly, okay? And uh, we didn't really get a chance to do the MBWs last night or last week. Um, to do MBWs, you can actually go back to a uh, new tracks segment. I think we did one in January or February just on MBWs. And then when we did our build along for the King Post Bridge, we actually had a, 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 like a repeat of it. So uh, we're not going to go over a whole bunch of it tonight, but we want to do a little bit just to give you an idea of what's going on. So I'm going to switch cameras now, if I can. Uh, <laughs> this is always an issue, right? <laughs> we do have the trouble of a low bandwidth tonight. So I hope we don't lose you. <laughs> There we go, Maureen. Okay, uh, so I'll show a, a couple of um, 
NBW installation. So this is a, on an O-scale model. Uh, chose a little bit bigger so that you hopefully might be able to see this. Uh, so what I do is I, I pilot a hole um, for the NBW placement and I'm using a drill bit to do that. But you could use um, a push, push pin, mm -hmm. a tack, something like that if you like, but I'm using this drill. So you just pilot a hole. And you'll see on the drawing that we put the um, NBWs on the tie guard. Okay, this is the model that I'm, I'm building right now. And if you look at the drawing, it shows that the NBW is on every fourth tie. So just follow your drawing and pilot your holes and put your NBWs every fourth tie. We get, we get asked if that is prototypical for every fourth tie. In the kit, uh, we have prototype pictures in there. And if you look at those pictures at the front of the instructions, you will actually see a trestle bridge with it at your eye. Okay, so I've got two holes and I'm sure that you probably can't see them, <laughs> but it is on, on every fourth tie, just two of them here. Then take your sprue of NBWs and take an, a very sharp X-Acto knife and put your, your pointer finger over top of the exacto knife and perhaps maybe cut off two or three of those NBWs. Leave quite a large tail on it. And if you hold your pointer finger over top of your exacto knife, those NBWs won't go flying away on you. So you, you can see I've left a pretty, pretty good tail on there. And then what to do next is um, get yourself a really um, great pair of pointy sharp tweezers. And the important thing is that the points are really in good contact with each other. So you can grab that NBW right under the head. So you want to get your NBW right under the head with that tweezer. Have yourself a little pot of glue next to your, your um, model. This is a wax paper. Just dip the tip of that NBW in the glue just a little bit and pop it in that pilot hole. Okay. I think you can see that. So take another one, just grab it underneath the head, pop it in the glue, and then pop it in the hole. Takes a little bit of patience for sure. Sometimes they pop off and jump all over the room. <laughs> but there's two of them done. So you've got a lot to do on that um, tie stringer assembly on every fourth tie. And then at the end of the project, what we'll do is we'll go back to our creosote black and just uh, put a wash over it. And what it does is it, it really highlights the, um, the head of that NBW. And it looks really, really good. And you're going to have a lot of these to do on the uh, trestle. You're going to have to do all the, uh, the braces on the vents. Um, so just if you, if you uh, need a reminder, just go back to our, you can go to our website and, and uh, look at some of our techniques there that will help you. Okay, so that's the NBW placement. If you're in N scale and you're doing the trestle, or whatever, whatever uh, model that you're doing in N scale, I use this pen. It's, um, it's a Zig memory system uh, pen that I found at Michael's and it's rust colored and it's great. You just, just take the pen and just dot where you want your NBWs to go. And it looks really good, quick and easy. It's extra fine and it's non-bleeding. Yeah, non-bleeding. So it works really well. One of the things I want to talk about in, in uh, when on the trestle, um, we didn't really discuss this last week, but the tie guard that goes along here, okay, when it gets to the little platform, sometimes it's cut out and sometimes it's not. So we like to do it just because it's different so that it's cut out like that. Can you see it? So it, it, so it does not continue across those three long ties, which are your platform. Just a little point. Yeah, you could do it either way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The big next step, which is what makes a trestle a trestle, it's called the bent assembly. Um, now, what's a bent? Okay. I did a lot of searching today. 
why is it called a bent? And you know what? I didn't find a lot that uh, uh, would explain that. One good theory that I did come across is that all bridges are straight, except for a trestle. A trestle is the only one that you can actually do on curves. So bent means it bends around. So when you do a trestle and you want to do it on a curve, it bends around. And, and the, the bent, being the past tense, uh, is what makes it go around the circle. Okay, that's the support that goes around the circle. That's the only logical explanation I've ever found of why it's called a bent. And bents are used on every bridge today. Every bridge that you go on the highway or train bridge or whatever has bents on it, somewhere or somehow. Okay. Go for it. All right. <laughs> so we're building a bent tonight. So what you need to do is get that uh, drawing and cut out that small section of your bent. So you've just got that view taped down to your board and then put wax paper over top and, and tape that down. You've got uh, three different sizes of lumber that you need to use for this bend. Uh, the 12 by 14s are used for the top sill and the bottom sill. And you've got your uh, 12 by 12 posts. And if you're doing the pile trestle, you're gonna have round dowels, 12 inch dowels for that part. And then the uh, bent braces are three by tens, okay? So a lot of cutting here. I've done a lot of the cutting um, prior to this evening, and um, but I'll, I'll just tell you how I did that. I used um, Al Collins Ultimation Sander and Repeater. I think you've all seen this and you've seen Al use it. I use this a lot to do my posts, my 12, 12 by 12 posts. It worked really well. There's a couple angles on these posts. There's a five degree and a 10 degree angle that it really came in handy and everything came out just perfect. I'm gonna, I told Al, I'm gonna have to redo all my models. <laughs> but you can do it the old conventional way to just uh, use your razor saw and um, cut your, your wood right on the drawing, okay? Um, and what I usually do is, is cut all my wood first. I'll cut all my post to the right angles, put them in little piles as to, you know, whether it's the outside post and then the second, second post and then the middle post, put them in piles. You've got four bents to do. So you've got a lot of lumber to cut. I usually, what I usually do, as I said, is cut all my lumber, lumber first. You can, you don't have to do that. You can cut just the lumber for the one bent and go ahead and build that one. That's fine. And then I usually cut all the, the bent braces as well, all at the same time. Just It's just easier, um, especially if you're using uh, one of Al's tools. And he introduced us today to his um, automation uh, slicer. slicer. Yeah, it's great. It this really this isn't well. even on the market yet. Um, Al's got a, the first batch undergo underway right now. Uh, he sent this down for us to give it a try. Yeah, it's it's um, great. I used it to cut all my uh, bent braces. It's, it's just, it's actually a blade. This is not a chopper. I'll tell you why it's not a chopper because when it goes down, it's in motion and slices. Um, the blade is really neat. It's a, a chisel blade, which means it's completely flat on one side and it's chiseled on the other side. So uh, uh, Al took us through a whole uh, Zoom seminar this afternoon on how to do it. But uh, we've used it a whole bunch in the last couple hours, Al. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, it's just like slicing butter. It really is. It's, um, it's fantastic. Great little tool. So that's what I was using this afternoon to do all my bent braces. Um, but but again, just uh, if you don't have these tools, just use a razor saw to cut your wood right on the drawing. Just lay whatever wood you're cutting right on the drawing and, and cut, okay? So what I do um, is put, if you're, if you're doing the pile trestle, what I like to do, because those dowels like to roll around, is put your double-sided tape across your drawing, okay? Or use your um, masking tape. And I like to put it right across either the top part of the trestle or the bottom part of the trestle. 
it just works so nice and it, and it keeps the um, dowels in place. It's not moving around on the, on the drawing. We do get asked a lot, why don't you have a jig? Well, um, for, for this purpose here on, on this particular design, you only have four bents and we can actually have the bents finished by the time you even thought about doing a jig for it. Um, it it's, it's not all that critical that everything be very symmetric, okay? Um, like if it's a little longer here and a little longer there, well, that's okay because it's all taken up with what's the, the structure that's underneath, be it uh, rock or concrete or cribbing or something like that. It's all uh, comes out in the wash, okay? So uh, we do not use a jig for this. Now, if you were doing the trestle that had 50 bents on it, yeah, I would go ahead and, and uh, make a jig for it. So what I do is I put the uh, top sill, uh, it's a 12 by 14. So you wanna put the 14, how do you say that, Rick? You want the- yeah, You want the, the bigger uh, dimension to be up and down. Vertical, okay, all right, there you go. So 12 by 14 on the top and 12 by 14 on the bottom. And then what I do is take your two outer 12 by 12 posts and glue them right on top of your drawing. And I usually let that set up. So I'll put um, some weights. Good old weathering mix. Yeah, weights on that bent, let it set up for, you know, a good, probably 10 minutes is, is good enough. It's similar to what you did for the tie stringer assembly. You, you do like the outside components of it so that it becomes a rigid, uh, uh, assembly by itself and then you don't have to worry about it flopping all over the place. And then you just want to start putting in your posts, your 12 by 12 posts or dowels, whichever you're using. And I've got those um, all cut to the perfect angle. And one of the uh, things about a bent again, um, usually there's one or two posts in the middle that are actually perpendicular to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then as the uh, posts move outwards, they become what's called battered. And it's not a big batter, it's just a little batter. So you can see that that, uh, uh, if it's, it can see through the drawing there, you can see it's narrow at the top and it's a little wider at the bottom. And this is one of the purposes of, of uh, one of the whole concepts of doing a bent, because that can carry on for uh, sometimes hundreds of feet. Uh, when it gets that big, there are other uh, things you have to do. But uh, like with this one being a six post bent, um, you can carry those angles for three or four stories. What's a story? Well, you can see that uh, this one is actually called two stories because it's uh, top and it's kind of split in the middle and that becomes two stories. Just um, put your posts in. Of course, if they're not fitting right, you might have to to um, file them down a little bit or sand them down with the sander. That's where the sander comes in really handy. Yeah. And I just put a little bit of glue and, and wipe off the X or take off the excess with a tweezer. Make sure there's no glue oozing out. And then of course you would want to weight that again with whatever you've got to let that set up. And then you've got your uh, bent braces that have to go on next. So I'm gonna pretend that that's been about 10 minutes <laughs> and start putting those on. So what you can do here is you'll see that where the brace goes across and you're drawing, just put a little dab of glue now these braces, um, one of the things they help do is every trestle is actually in a valley uh, where it has a wind tunnel effect. So the winds are always coming down the valley. So the whole thing here is to have such a secure structure that it will not sway when that wind comes down the, the, the valley. So through a, a series of braces going across and braces diagonally, it stiffens it right up so that it will not move, even under hurricane conditions. Uh, 
And uh, there's it's two ways of doing a prototypical here. Um, we like to do it so that all the ends are a 90 degree cut. Uh, sometimes you'll find a trestle that they got real fancy and every end is actually cut on the angle of whatever it's mating to. Uh, it's not necessary. Um, it's just, I, I guess the carpenters wanted something extra to do, I don't know. <laughs> but we've seen them both ways. Maybe. We also get asked, why is that a three by 10 instead of two by 10, in by 10 popular? Well, we find in structures such as this, um, they use three by 10s and, and a lot of three by 12s uh, just for the sure uh, capacity of the wood in the structure. Uh, two by 10s, two by 12s seem to be too weak and they just wouldn't hold it. And four by, uh, four by 10s or four by 12s just uh, were too big, too heavy. I'm dabbing a little bit too much glue on here. I'm going to try and go a little bit easier. One more on this side, and then you have to repeat the same on the other side. And like we said before, Triangles. A triangle is the strongest uh, joint you can get. And you'll see that trestles are just full of triangles. Rick, do you know on the wood size for the sway bracing and the bents for narrow gauge, is that the same or it's how much lighter? It, it's basically the same because um, the integrity of the structure is, is what's important. And uh, they found out that, uh, that they'll keep it all the same, okay? Uh, it's part of the engineering uh, integrity of it, is, for lack of a better word. Um, the narrow gauge that we saw are all the same as what the big ones are. So I've got those um, down. I would, of course, let them let them set up and dry a little bit before I flip them over. But I'm going to do that now. So here you had that side done. Now you turn it over. Yeah. And do exactly the same thing all over again. If you see any glue on the other side, just uh, scrape it off with your tweezers. And what's neat about doing it this method is uh, the, the ones that are diagonal become a big X. Yeah, so if you put that back on your drawing, these, this one stays the same. So what you can't see off camera is there's piles and piles of pre-cut wood here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you mustn't sneeze. <laughs> okay. And I'll usually jump to that middle one. So you can see that there's so many triangles in there that this structure will not move. I used to think it was called a bent because it could bend, but no, it doesn't. The bridge bends, but the bent doesn't. And then you can put those opposite to what the other side, so it forms an X. Probably one of the big things is don't get all the woods sizes mixed up. 
when you pre-cut them, make sure you distinctly put them in different piles so that yeah. you don't get them mixed up. Little sticky notes help. And yeah, and if you notice the one she's doing now actually goes beyond the post right up to the top sill. Yeah. So those sway breezes are all on. Let them uh, set up and dry. And then you can go ahead and put the NBWs on. And you'll see the placement of those on your drawing. Okay. So here's your bed. And now every joint, every time two pieces of wood come is an NBW. Yeah. So that's a lot of homework for you to do. Well, I didn't don't know if you want to talk about the abutments, um, Rick. Um, yeah, yeah I, we have time. Okay, at the end where the bridge actually meets the earth, uh, it's it's what called an abutment. Uh, it's not really a bent, but it kind of looks like a bent. So uh, in this particular design. It, uh, it's the same angles and, this, and so on, but it doesn't go down as far. So uh, the top sill is the same as all the rest. The uh, posts are the same, but they're shorter. And then it's a shorter uh, uh, bottom sill too, okay? Uh, we don't want you to add, add the planking at this time, but you can go ahead and build those too. It's just that they're a little shorter. Yeah, same same principles as the bent. And they don't have any braces on them. And that's on page 13 of your instructions. I think that's, I think that's it. It's starting to look like it. I think so, yeah. This is what makes a trestle a trestle. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about anything we did? Marie, what, what drill, what size drill did you use? If you said an O scale, do you use a straight pin? Yeah, what, what size is that? Really? Um, that looks like about uh, 64. Okay. A number 64 or maybe a little um, smaller. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like the king post, it's easy because we include, because it has a rod in it, we include the drill bit that will do that. And you use it for the MBWs also. But uh, this kit, because there's no rods, we don't supply you a drill bit for this one. And you know, it doesn't really matter that the hole is a little too big. Uh, it just makes a, the, the uh, target for the MBW just a little easier. Got it. Thank if you. you make it too small, it's really aggravating. Yeah. I have a question about this kit. Uh, you've mentioned several times that you can make it as a curved trestle. Uh, and on your web page, I think it says a slight curve. Um, I'm working in OM30 and, and looking at your S scale trestle. And will it? Yes. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any reason I couldn't do a 22 inch radius curve. Um, good question. You can actually do it. Uh, in any curve. At slight is not the right word there. Um, you you got to be careful of any of the scales that you don't want the curve to be uh, out of proportion to what, what's going on. Like, like in HO, um, you get down to an 18 inch radius, that's getting pretty tight. So uh, that's why I said a slight curve, right? Like it, it, you can spread the curve out farther uh, just to make it look right. Doing it too tight, it's just not very good. If you've uh, ever seen us at a show, uh, the curved trestle that we have as a demonstrator on our uh, table is really, really, really curvy. <laughs> like, um, I think it's, um, mm, I think it's like a 13 or a 14 inch curve, which in HO, which is way out of whack. Um, but yeah. Uh, we're one of the few that have actually documented how to do the curve and it's included in each package. Um, it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, there's a few basic rules of thumb. Um, 
uh, basically a bent is usually, and I say usually, uh, perpendicular to the track. Now, not always, like we've seen all sorts of trestles where it uh, is perp perpendicular to the road that's under it or the stream that's under it. So the bent placement is not always straight or perpendicular. Um, the other thing is on a curve is the curve is actually made out of many, many tangents. Okay. And we explain that in our instructions. So uh, through many, many little tangents, you can actually come up with the curve. Mr. Rick, I've got a question for you, sir. Yep. So uh, Ms. Maureen said that uh, the last one she was doing was on page 13 in the instruction booklet. Yes. Um, my booklet only goes to page nine. <laughs> what did you do with the other pages? Maple <laughs> in, young man. <laughs> you know what to do is um, after we're off the air, send us an email, and we'll send. Uh, um, we might be able to do it electronically. Yeah, I, I just send the, the, the files to you. Cool. Thank you so much. Maybe the stapler didn't staple right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the stapler being a person, not a machine. Because <laughs> it's funny, I actually have the, when we spoke an email prior to the class, you know, uh, you would advise on trying the S scale, which is the one that I'm doing with y'all. Yeah. But I also have one that's in the actual O scale as well. Yes. And that one only goes to page eight for the O scale. Oh, that old. That, boy, that might be a really, really old kit. Do they have the pictures? Do, does, do, do your instructions have the images with them? Um, I got the... There should be multiple images on every page. Negative, sir. This is... Oh, so that's have... really old. Yeah. Okay. That's... And then the S scale kit, which is this one, I've got the one image and that's it. And I've got the uh, the plans sitting on the other bench right now. Hmm. Wow, that that those are really old kits. <laughs> we'll send, yeah, we'll send you. Chris, is it? Yeah, we'll yes, send you a. Well, yeah, we'll send you the whole set of instructions electronically. Thank you so much, guys. So we we met. We got to a point one time where you know what we should have pictures because a picture is worth a thousand words. So then our instructions went from eight pages up to I don't know. 60 some of them I guess uh, just because of that many images we try to do an image of every step that there is on a, on a kit okay I'll uh, I'll go send you that email right now thank you again both absolutely thank you sorry about that oh it's okay I chalk it up to Murphy's Law it's like with my drill bit <laughs> my drill bit. and Murphy's pretty old <laughs> but now we got it right so we're good thank you so much you're quite welcome thank you any other questions? Yeah, I have one uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, with the nut, nut bolt and washer castings. Yes. Um, it, it seems that you're doing the bents only on one side. Wouldn't that actually nope. go all the way through? Nope. Nope. Um, because of the way the casting is, it's only very shallow. So you put them all on one side, then you flip it over and put them all on the other side. Oh uh, no, I meant on uh, on the bents themselves. Oh, in reality, yeah, they're they're a bolt that goes all the way through. So, uh, so you would have to uh, do the nut and bolt washer on both sides of where they connect. Yes. And because uh, right now the, the way you have on the the drawing is only on one side. Yeah, I didn't mark the other one because it would be too confusing. <laughs> like when you put the, the braces on, okay, the ones that are actually horizontal will go through the, the uh, go through the brace, go through the post, go through the brace on the other side. And the ones that are diagonal only go through the post. So that would be a different size uh, uh, bolt. Oh, okay. And, and usually on the, the uh, opposite side, depending on what type of uh, they use, if they use a, like a stove bolt, then the head's not even big enough to, to worry about it. 
But um, usually what they did was one bolt and two nuts, one on each side. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of nails were used. Like some of the nails that we've gathered, they're uh, 12 inches long, 16 inches long, and, and they're maybe half an inch in diameter or three eighths of an inch in diameter. That's how big the nails are. Um, on We don't put uh, nails, we don't indicate where they are on any of our kits because they're just too small. All right, thank you. Rick, I've got a question that's more of a prototype question. Um, yeah. so like when you've got the the board along the edge of the ties and you put the wa the nut bolt washer in every fourth tie, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. What held the other ties in place? Were they just held there by gravity or what, you know? That, that was usually the nail. Every tie is usually attached somehow, okay? Now on really sophisticated ones, they actually uh, uh, use like a, a mortise and tenon type thing. So the ties were actually uh, well, not so much the tie, but the guard itself was uh, grooved out so that it fit on top of the ties so it would hold them in alignment. Um, but that's very seldom have we ever seen that because that took an awful lot more work uh, for, the, for the carpenters and there wasn't a lot of benefit from it. So most of them are just one wood on top of another wood. They didn't so have chainsaws either. It, it's so, just like the, the, what Maureen's doing right now. They were probably all mortise and tenon to make them super strong. Okay. So, so you're saying that the, those ties, like the tie that didn't have the bolt down through it, was just kind of held on by the other, by the tie end of the tie board yeah if it. if they really wanted to they could put one of those big nails through it okay okay i'm just curious like i was wondering about that i was wondering you know just would friction just hold all that together no yeah. rick uh b before the show we were talking and, and ed said that he had trouble getting the ties straight am i right ed that is correct. The the ties are a little bit. Uh, I can't probably see it that well, but they are sort of not uh, not as straight as I, I would assume. That's what the they would make them as. Is there is there something that is there a trick to it, uh, Rick? Is something that Ed could or, or other modelers could do to to to. Uh, one of the things we explained last time is, is um, just for the convenience of it, um, when you have the tape uh, sticky side up, you put on every fourth tie. And then at that point, you don't use the drawing anymore. You use your eyesight. So when you put the three ties in between every fourth tie, you use your eyesight to line it up. Um, that's probably the best way to do it is with your eyesight. If it looks crooked, it's probably crooked. And, and when you're at the glue stage, that's why you should do it then. Um, it, it's not a, a, a overly a big deal because over time, wood takes on all its own characteristics. And uh, like wood expands and contracts whenever it wants and it starts to warp whenever it wants. And we've, we've seen ties that are warped two or three inches out of place. Uh, it, it's just one of the natures of wood. Yeah, it, was, it, uh, actually gives, it, it gives it some character. Yes. <laughs> now, what I was actually uh, saying that uh, I got everything nice and straight, you know, with each other and all that. But the position is uh, the position of the tie is not uh, consistent. As I said, I'm not quite sure if you can actually see the top there, but see how uh, like right here, it's sort of like dipped uh -huh. down a little bit. Sorry, I don't have your image in front of me at all. Oh, okay, well, well, that's sort of kind of pointless. Then. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch the. Re I guess you have to watch the reroad and and see the little picture in the corner. <laughs> like like I say, um, when Maureen started doing this, she was very uh, symmetrical, and over the years, I've tried to say, don't be so symmetrical. 
because it's not the only ties that are really symmetrical are the cement ones, uh, which is a, a more uh, modern thing in the last couple of decades. Um, but one ones, they go everywhere. And when, when you see them replace the ties, you can see that they are just, the wood, the junk, like they, they fall apart. They do, they take on a mine of their own if you let them. So yeah, every, every tie has some type of secure uh, thing to it. And mostly they're nails. Hmm. If, you, if you look in the package, um, you should have a, the prototype pictures in the beginning of the, uh, of the instructions. Um, the one that shows the trestle that has the MBW is every fourth tie. I don't think it's clear enough that you can actually see the nail heads because they usually like countersink them in. I'll look that up. I don't think All right, another, another quick question. Uh, what is the gauge of the guardrails? Well, I'll tell you what I've learned about that. Okay, I'm just looking at the picture. Um, let's see if we can put it on here. So this picture here actually shows along every fourth tie, but it's not close enough to show actually the nail heads coming through it. Um, you can see just inside, there seems to be another row of nail heads uh, like right down the middle there, there seems to be uh, nail heads. Now I can't tell that may be oil dripping. It's really hard to tell. It's been many years that we were actually on this bridge. Okay, guardrails. Um, what I've learned uh, is no matter what your scale is, use the next code down for your guardrails. Um, like if you're uh, in HO, if you got code 100, use a code 86 for your guardrail because your guardrails are usually rusty as can be. And if you use a bright boy over uh, all the rails, it's gonna take all that rust off the guardrail. So when you use just one code down, it, I don't know, it just seems to look better afterwards. And guardrails weren't used um, on small bridges. Like one of the candles that we did, you, you wouldn't have a guardrail on it, but on this type, you would have a guardrail. Uh, the, the placement is just uh, in inside the rails, the, the, the main rails, a little bit more than what the flange of the wheel would be. Um, like usually about four or five inches inward. And the modern day ones, uh, they don't even use guardrails. We have a huge, huge bridge just uh, about a mile from our place here. And they just replaced all the track and all the ties and, and so on. And they didn't put any guardrails on it at all. So I guess the modern day is they, they just don't do it. Gotcha. I've been doing a lot of research, Sean, yet, especially with respect to the Rio Grande Southern. And you can take your pick. There are proto prototype trestles on the Rio Grande, guardrails on the inside, trestles with guardrails on the outside, and trestles with no guardrails at all. Yeah. And, and another thing is when, when it's a trestle that's on a curve, they put only one on the outside of the curve, like um, inside the, mail ra the main rail, but only one, uh, instead of doing two guardrails, they just put one on the outside of the circumference of it. You get what I mean? Like um, just inside the outer rail. Yep. So it would only have one guard rail then. So what's for the next show, Rick? Next show, um, we're uh, going to do a little bit more. Um, well, the homework should be, you know, doing all the vents and doing the NBWs for them and, and so on. That's a lot of homework, that's a lot of hours. And uh, what we're gonna do is um, if everybody's get that far, we're actually gonna put the bent to this tie stringer assembly. There, you can just see it right there. Uh, there's all sorts of little tricks with that. Um, we'll go over that next week. So 
if you're trying to get ahead of us, eh, we want to put the plank. Better be this. careful. Yeah, we have to do the planking on the back of the uh, of the of the abutment. And then put the put the bents to the stringers. Right? Yeah, yeah. So what would be a good tool for next week would be a square. This is the square that we use. Oh, I think that does it for this week, eh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All you guys, you're doing a great job. The pictures that you've already sent in and, and the comments you've sent in, hey, it's great. Okay, thank Jim. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you both so very much. Really do appreciate it. And and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that everybody is uh, uh, getting as far along as they are. And, and uh, you all are certainly doing a great job. Thanks so much again. And now for our next one is uh, Bob Farquhar. You're welcome, Jim. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, is Bob Farquhar, who's going to talk to us about basic elect electricity 102. Last time, I didn't think that uh, uh, many people were going to have much to say about basic electricity, and boy, was I surprised. So, Bob, welcome back and looking forward to uh, session two on electricity. All right, here we go. There we go. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Hang on. Wrong one. Start again. There we go. That's the one I want right there. Okay, this is the uh, Basic Electricity 102. And hopefully it's not too boring for people. And starting off here, most of the electric circuits have some kind of a fuse of some sort. Uh, this is a small sampling of the type of fuse. So I use this type here all the time. Uh, oh, and they're in the smaller one here. And they got glass fuses in there like this one. And they can fit in here. This is automotive type here. That's available as well. Uh, but there's tons of other types out there. And uh, But make sure you have some kind of fusing in the electric circuit. Transformers, I've talked about this before. And the wall warts, you have to pay attention on the back side of them. There's always written in there. A 20, 120 volts coming in and the voltage coming out could be 12 volts, could be 18 volts, could be five, could be three. Uh, and it will indicate whether it's AC or DC. So pay attention to that because you couldn't get, but plug into AC here and get AC, come, AC coming out. So pay, atten pay attention to what you're getting. Uh, these type of transformers, talk about these last week. Uh, this is center tap, center tap type of transformer. This one is as well as AC coming here in the bottom. And there's three taps here at the top. I'm only going to use two in this particular case because I only need uh, plus 12 volts coming out of this thing. So this, this is a diode bridge in here. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, this is a review last week. Uh, diode here um, works on one direction, like going this way, but not going this way. So pay attention to that. And there, there's the... That little bar there that's shown on the diagram, that's that little black uh, stripe here in the bottom back of the diode, diode here. Uh, resistors, I explained that last week. All these bands in here and the uh, tolerance is the last band. Now capacitors, mentioned this last week, this type of capacitor here with the black stripe or the arrow in here points, points to the negative on the uh, actual Actual, actually, actual, anyway, this type of capacitor, uh, that crimp in here it indicates a positive side, okay? These are ceramic capacitors, and they don't, doesn't matter which side is positive, which side is negative. So voltage regulator, uh, this is going, if you're going to be uh, doing your own power supplies, uh, they probably will have one of these things. Now, th this, is, this one here, you have to pay attention to the numbers when you're buying them. Uh, that 78 is indicating it's going to be a positive voltage coming out. A 79 indicates a negative. This, this case, is five volts coming out. So you could have 10 volts coming in, and you're going to get five volts coming out. Because of that, this has to dissipate a bunch of heat. So heat sink is uh, pretty much a necessity on these. And they bolt through here, this little bolt. And uh... Now, this is a diode bridge. And this is basically what it does. It takes the negative part of the AC uh, wave and puts it back on top here. So it ended up being like this. That's DC. 
These are in examples of diode bridges. Uh, there's the small one here. That'd be good maybe for a quarter amp or 500 milliamps type of thing. That's good for about five amp. This is probably good for 10 to 15 milliamps, same idea. And there's another way of doing uh, diode bridge. Uh, there, there's one there. I'm going to come back to this picture in a moment. And there is a way you do them with just four individual diodes. Uh, for these kits type of thing, it's cheaper to do that than a diode bridge because diode bridge costs a bit of money, more than this than four of these. So in this example, there's your AC coming in on off switch. There's a fuse transformer comes AC coming in, AC is coming out. In this example, it's going to be a 18 volt output. And uh, you do 18 because do you lose voltage through all these uh, capacitors and the voltage regulators and so on to end up at 12 volts coming out. So what you do, you go through the diode bridge here and that now converts that AC down to DC. And, and then you take uh, the the, the output up here, there's a 7912. This is for negative 12 volts. And this M7812 is for the positive 12 volts. And the capacitors are to uh, basically regulate the DC signal coming out. So it's, uh, you know, regulated DC output over here. And this is in case you want LEDs in here. And this resistor is a thousand ohm resistor just for the dropping it down to three volts in between the, that 12 volt here in the ground. And these, uh, you have to pay attention to these uh, voltage regulators too, that comes with a diagram, which one's the input, output, and what the ground is. And pay attention to that, because this is different. The 7812 and the 7912 are different. So, so this example here, there's a, this a, a variable output. This goes from anywhere from five volts to 30 volt output, DC. AC coming in here, diode bridge, capacitors to clean up the signal. A voltage regulator with a heat sink. And this is a potentiometer or adjustable resistor. Another capacitor just to finally clean up everything. And then the DC output, in this case, it's only positive volt coming out. So, and these ones, I uh, didn't uh, mention these last week on the switches. There's, these are momentary uh, lever switches. So it's momentary because uh, that little plunger, when that's uh, activated, it will actually go from the uh, normally closed, like here, to the normal, I'm sorry, normally open to the normally closed. And it only lasts as long as that is pushed down. As soon as that's released, it opens back up again to nothing. So this is the common one here, and this is the, uh, the output on here. Now, hard to see on this one, but that's that diagram here, that's a common there. And that's not normally closed, and this is normally open here. And when it's activated, uh, it, that'll go down here. Uh, this this particular especially long lever here, but some of them are only about uh, this long here. And this one has a roll on it here in case you want to do something with a cam. So you have a rotating cam and it push down this and uh, activate something and release it again later. And re relays. Uh, the reason for relay is most the uh, power circuits, they, they can't do, for example, you've got... Uh, Power supply going in like maybe one amp or whatever, and you want to have something for five amps coming out. So what you do, you put your voltage in here, activate the relay. You have heavier uh, contacts inside. There's three examples here, so that would have three different outputs if you want. Uh, and these contacts here for that's a different one, but um, it gives you you get heavier output out there. So. There's an example, you can buy these in a, in a row and you get the uh, voltage come in. And this diagram shows you 12 volts to activate the relay. And there's the output, there's normally closed here, which is the same as this one. This one here is close to this one. And when it activates, it will act, they'll go from here to here. Uh, this is an example of power supply. I have two of them in here. Uh, it did originally have two separate 12 volt uh, outputs. But I since changed them, I got a five volt and a seven volt. And one of the five volt is for an Arduino. I got a seven volt for the actual motor running uh, from the output of the Arduino. <clears throat> of course, on off switch, a fuse. Now this thing is a little LED, uh, tells you what the voltage is on the output. Now that's connected to the output of the, the five volt and the seven volt. So you pull this up. This is a center off switch. 
push it up, and then it probably sh it should show five volts. Push it down, it should say seven. That it lets you know that you're actually getting power out of the unit. Uh, this breadboard, you hear about there's these things. If you haven't seen one, this is pretty much what they're like. You can get smaller ones as well. And the idea is testing your uh, electronics and so on. And because uh, you're not sure, this is a sure way to be able to test them all. So the idea is negative here, positive here, or maybe another positive. And that row here, all connected underneath, all together. That's all common along here. Same with each row along here, a gap in here. So that is not connected to this one. And these are not, this row is not connected either road on the roads on either, either side. And the idea is you take your power from here somewhere, bring it across to whatever you want here to this row for this LED. And then that goes through the resistor. And that, that's not the right hole. That's just stuck in there just to make the point of the, <laughs> anyway. And these DuPont connectors, I think I mentioned this before. You can get these in various lengths. So these all separate if you want, unless you want to leave them all together. Uh, there is, these are male to male. You can get uh, female to female, and you can get uh, you can get male to female. So you get short ones as well, but this long here, and they get uh, medium size. This one, this is the long ones here, and they're great for pushing into the into here for going from, for example, here over to this over here. So, for example, just test these things out. And there's a DCC tester in case you've never seen one. This is great if you're going to be doing a bunch of DCCs or decoders in your locomotives. And this was a cape equipped to be able to do sound as well. So you connect the track power coming in here and you connect your decoder in through the, all these connectors here. These are quick connects. And you got like LEDs in here. It'll tell you what the hell, what, what's going on, what's happening. And this electromagnetic, I use this like, because I had uh, uh, permanent magnets in, the, in the certain areas I wanted to uh, decouple um, rolling stock. And uh, what happens though, you've got some uh, cars you want to push in somewhere, you don't want them to be covering that point. So I put the electric mannings in there. And, uh, and then what you do is you activate it through a push button. And then, uh, then you make sure that that will decouple that particular one. If you don't want to use it, you don't touch anything. You just pull the local uh, and the rolling stock in and out. So this common problems, uh, trying to figure out, the this is all basic stuff here. So this DC, uh, this, for example, of a reverse loop, and you got a positive here on the, in the red, going through on the outside, and because back in here has got a, debit, a dead short because it's coming back into the negative. And uh, same thing happens here with the Y when you come in here and you're coming back into the negative. And same with the turntable, OK, coming in, for an example, rotate the turntable around, uh, the positive and negative are backwards. You got positive feeding into the negative right away. As soon as the train crosses that gap, you got a short. So what you have to do on DC, you would use a double pole, double throw switch. And what you do is you take your uh, roll, um, yeah, motor power into the loop. While it's in that loop, you have to flip the switch here as well as change the direction on your power uh, pack. So you have to do the same thing in here, for example, on the Y and the same thing on the turntable. So on the DCC world, now a nice thing it is that and on the coders, they don't care which rail is the positive and negative. And if, it, if you're running along and it helps to switch to the opposite way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't help, uh, affect the locomotive at all. So these units, you know, this is one example here from uh, model, wherever that MRC is anyway. Uh, the way, idea is you go from your power, track power, and then on into this unit, into the track. And when you're on this note here, when on the DCC, as a train or the engine, for example, crosses this gap here to be a short, and absolutely, it, within fractions of a second, it actually reverses the power in that loop. So in place of this, you would have that, this component here. And it's so fast, there that ha faster than the your DCC system uh, identifying a short. And uh, so this this reverse power it happens so fast. They don't he not in the local mode hip cups or anything does nothing. You can't tell. Uh, this is a power sheet again. Now DCC when somebody does a short on a uh, on the next day you're working on the yard. Somebody causes a short. 
the whole system shuts down and none of the operators know who has done this. So with a power shield and this example here, I have uh, this one here goes to the yard. This one goes to my main, the main, the track all around the layout. This is my ferry terminal in here, and this is for future. So th this particular one has uh, four. You can buy, get them with eight. You can get them with just one if you want. And uh, and then, and anyway, so that's the, that's the idea of this, uh, the DCC getting a short. Now, Tortoise, uh, I'm going to do this because I'm going to tell you about a problem I had. Uh, now, this is for the contacts inside. There's actually contacts in here. And this is what all the contacts are. So the outside contacts, of course, for the motor. And these are uh, contacts common here. The four and five are con con common to that side. And then they go either that one or down to this one. So this is what the inside lo looks like. And the motor, of course, has to... Uh, they, they, these electric motors spin so fast, they have to be geared down. So this uh, dropping down the gears uh, speed. And this is the final uh, thing that actually on this arm here, pivot in here, and there's a uh, little gears on the bottom of that and actually rotates that arm. And there, there are the gear, the little, what there. They, so the gear from the motor actually comes through here and rotate, rotates, rotates that. These contacts, these large spot in this one and that one, that's common for this one or that one. This is common for this one or this one. So that's how they make. Now, what happened in mine, I got bought a package of six and all, every one of them was defective. And what happened in one direction, it worked perfectly. And the other direction, I had shorts everywhere. And what happened on uh, these little contacts right here, on the other side of this, there's a little plastic uh, nipple stick, sticking out. And they stick them on there and they put the heat to it and then flats out a little bit of that uh, little nipple. And what happened, it, they broke off on every one of them. So what happens is when it rotated one way, it was fine. When the other way, everything moved off and then sorted each other. So that's what they look like in there. So there's the motor gearing on the other side, comes through here and then uh, rotates this. So this is an example of using the extra contacts here. So you take the rail power in here and then through the common, you take that to your turnout frog, for an example. Another example is do uh, green and red uh, signals, and you do that through the contacts if you like. And I mentioned this last week. This is another way of doing it. If you only have a, a 12, plus 12 volt uh, power supply or night, nine, these uh, tortoises work on nine volt as well, nine to, nine to 16 volts they work on. So, and this is a way to uh, wire them so you can. Uh, can have them go either way. And, there, and that's if you have it in two different plate locations. Um, that's another way of doing the wiring. And that's it. Any questions? Good. Uh, need to see that last slide again. What's that, sorry? Need to see that last slide for a, and hold it for a second. Okay. And the last one here. That one? No, the... Um, that one? Yes, that. Okay. Whoops. What did I do? Sorry. That was my fault. What happened? I got it. You got it there? There you go. Thank you. You got it? Okay. Uh, this one here actually you know, can be a single pole, single throw. It doesn't have to be a double pole. But, okay. Any other questions for Bob? Yeah, Bob, did you ever get your money back on those bad tortoises? Oh, what happened is they got them on sale, so I bought them on them. It wasn't until two years later they went oh, out and no. used them. And I couldn't find the other thing that happened. I was using a bunch of bell wire, uh, and uh, the wire that two of them I actually had the internal, like the there was no uh continuous uh copper in the sheath, the sheath was there, but the copper inside was not. So there were two of them that had an open 
wiring, but where is the problem? Like, you know, like <laughs> it took me, I, I was a couple of days messing around with that, that, trying to figure it out when it's funny happened anyway. Good fun. Hey, Bob, it's Corey. Yes. Uh, I was talking to uh, NCE yes. uh, the other day, and you know what? One of the first things they said to me was doing two full five amp systems, like the yeah. new, uh, put a wire between the two of them. Right, right. Um, we talked about that, I think, last week, and yeah. I think Phil was on, and he said, well, you know, they, they decided or their technology wasn't that way. However, when I talked to them, they immediately said, just take one of the screws off the yeah. bottom of the box, wrap a wire around it, and go to the other one to ground it. Right, right. Right on. I think that was a post, a post installation or a post design thing because they just say use one of the screws on the case. I actually read that as well. Yeah. And because uh, then I said, and, and you know, they can hear you, you know. Um, and uh, they were saying, all right, when I talked to, and I happen to know the guys there, and uh, I said, okay, I'm going to sound really smart. Is that for the phase issue? And they go, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay. And, and and one of the guys goes, see, Clark, here. I, should, I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have friends. <laughs> I play an electrical engineer on Zoom. That's right. <laughs> that should be really considered a reference uh, common, not a ground. Yeah, right. Right. And I, I forget what how even they put it. It was kind of like, uh, oh, I forget what actually he told me, like what he called it. And uh, he says, it's also kind of a little safety feature. <laughs> So, all right, that was my big two cents. And these guys, they don't even have five cents. So, Bob, thank you so much for doing this. I really okay. do appreciate it. I think we learned something. But thanks again. Now, normally I would turn to our featured modeler tonight, but uh, the scheduled featured modeler, Mike uh, uh, Gaynor, uh, has been having some health problems. And uh, I talked to him uh, a few days ago, and he just did not feel up to doing it tonight. So I hope he gets better real soon, and we'll reschedule it probably for after the first of the year for him to come back. Uh, but I'm sorry that uh, we don't have a featured modeler this evening. So that pretty well wraps us up for tonight. Uh, for next show on September the 22nd, uh, Rick and Marie Hunter will be back with their build along of their trestle. Uh, Martin Breckbuild, MMR, will start his build along of the Leadville Designs Maintenance of Way Car. And our featured modeler is all of you because we have the My Build with uh, Chris Course as the moderator next week. And I really, again, encourage you to, uh, to show us your models and show us what you've been working on and uh, share it with people who may get some real motivation from knowing about what you've done and how you've done it and see some of the, uh, the results that you've been able to obtain. So thanks so much for being here this evening. Again, I apologize uh, for the short show, uh, but I hope you understand the, uh, the situation. Uh, thanks again for coming. Best for modeling for you for until the following show and see you then. Thank you so much for being here.